The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the Philip Guston scandal. What does the postponement of a big show of the American artist's work tell us about museums' response to art and race in the wake of Black Lives Matter? I'll talk to the critics and curators Barry Schwabsky and Andrea Emmerleif about the four-year postponement of Philip Guston now at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, the Museums of Fine Arts in Houston and Boston, and at Tate Modern in London in a moment. Also this week, Louisa Buck meets Maggie Hambling as a new show of her work opens at Marlborough Gallery in London. And Work of the Week is back after a short break. The artist Martha Tuttle talks about a medieval visitation in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Before all that, the art newspapers launched a new three-part online live event series called New Models for New Times, Rethinking the Art Market in a Changing World. The third and final event in the series, featuring a conversation between the economist Claire McAndrew and the art newspaper's editor-at-large Georgina Adam on the future of the art market, is on the 22nd of October. You can register for this and other online events at theartnewspaper.com live. Now, three weeks ago, it was announced that a long-planned survey of Philip Guston's work at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, Tate Modern in London, and the Museums of Fine Arts in Boston and Houston was being postponed as a response to the emergence of the, quote, racial justice movement that started in the US and radiated to countries around the world. The show, which was due to feature numerous paintings by Guston with hooded figures evoking the Ku Klux Klan, would be delayed, the museum stated, quote, until a time when we think that the powerful message of social and racial justice at the centre of Philip Guston's work can be more clearly interpreted. The decision met with a tide of criticism and outrage, not least from Tate Modern's curator, Mark Godfrey, and from Guston's daughter and the president of the Guston Foundation, Musa Meyer. Later, a letter protesting the decision, signed by more than 100 leading art world figures, including Ellen Gallagher, Isaac Julian, Julie Moretu, Adrian Piper, Pope L, Martin Perrier, Henry Taylor and Micheline Thomas, among many others, was published in the Brooklyn Rail. I spoke to the author of that letter, the critic and curator Barry Schwabsky, and to another critic and curator, Andrea Emmerleif, who criticised the museum's decision in the Guardian newspaper. Barry, before we start talking about the museum statements and what's happened can we just set in stone what the work was that we're talking about because there are two phases aren't there well it's interesting that you want to start out by talking about what the work is that's involved because that's i have to say precisely the thing that's not specified in the original uh announcement from the national gallery in washington where they say we're postponing the exhibition until a time at which we think that the powerful message of social and racial justice that is at the center of Philip Guston's work can be more clearly interpreted. Well, what is what is that message and what what makes them think it needs more precise uh, interpretation? They don't mention anywhere what that is. And I think that already uh, is a kind of strange a clue to how evasive the uh, the management of the National Gallery is being about this whole situation. But of course, what we all are aware of is the fact that uh, at two points in his career, very early on when he was a teenager, and uh, then later on in the 1960s, Gustin dealt with imagery that included uh, hooded Ku Klux Klansmen. And, you know, when he was uh, doing that as a young man, he was doing it as a leftist uh, activist. Uh, I'm not sure if he was exactly a communist uh, or, you know, something in the area of that. But, you know, he was doing this as propaganda agitation art to show people the horrors of white racism. Uh, and not only of white racism, but also uh, the anti-Semitism that he himself had lived and experienced. He went through a long journey as an artist that took him from from that kind of work that he was doing, as I say, when he was a teenager, to more symbolically and metaphorically 
uh, freighted uh, figurative painting, and then, like many of his generation, uh, a very difficult sort of conversion, I think I have to use almost that kind of religious terminology, uh, to abstraction. And he became well known as one of the abstract expressionist, friends with de Kooning and Pollock and all the rest, and practiced that with great skill and depth for, for many years. But then at a certain point uh, in the, uh, the late 1960s, he became uneasy with it. And he said, uh, I'm tired of all this purity. He had to find another thing to do with his art. And uh, as I say, with great kind of soul searching and, and internal struggle, he invented a new kind of figurative painting for himself, which is much kind of rawer and cruder and more visceral than the things he had done uh, as a young man. Uh, and part of the imagery uh, initially of those were these, these hooded clansmen. Now he's looking at them from a different viewpoint. He compared himself to one of his favorite writers, Isaac Babel, uh, who had, uh, who was like likewise Jewish, and who had gone and lived with and wrote about the the Cossacks who were extremely uh, anti-Semitic, and he kind of thought, well, if Babel could put himself among these Cossacks who are the opposite of him, and yet find what he had in common with them, I should be able to imagine myself inside that hood. What if I'm the bad guy? So now it was, again, in, in tune with everything that was going on in the 60s that he was very aware of and very involved in. It was a protest, but it was a different kind of protest. It was also a protest that, that was a self-examination and a need to examine his own guilt or sense of guilt. That's something that you pick up on in your article, Andrea, isn't it? You, you know, it's about this this desire to understand evil, to get in the head of the white supremacist. So can you say something about, about your response in that sense? So when I came across um, the decision to cancel Philip Guston, I instantly thought about what Philip Guston's paintings mean to the current climate. He was firstly a figurative painter and he developed a unique style of abstract expressionism. But what I think is important to realise is that although we're talking primarily about the Ku Klux Klan paintings, that is quite a small part of his practice. He started with his representations um, in a large-scale fresco from the 30s with Ruben Kaddish, um, the struggle against terrorism, which depicted Nazi and Ku Klux Klan violence. And I think that when we think, when we realise that he has been doing this since the 30s and this is prompted by the violence and civil unrest in the late 60s and his sort of compulsion to tell the story of America, I think that telling the story of Guston as a whole, but including all of his motives and discussions and ideas as to what it's like to live in America as a Jewish man and so resonating with the um, crosses to bear that black people and people from um, different minorities have had to deal with in America and in, I guess, in a wider debate. I know it felt confusing um, to hear that this isn't the sort of art we should be seeing right now. Um, I don't know what you think, Barry. Do you, do you agree? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally in agreement. And I was really... Uh sort of taken aback by Darren Walker's statement to the New York Times. Darren Walker is the director of the Ford Foundation in the yeah. States. And he's uh, one of the trustees of the National Gallery of Art and uh, seemingly uh, one of the main proponents of this move to supposedly postpone uh, the Gustin show. He said in the past few months, the context in the U.S. has fundamentally profoundly changed on issues of incendiary and toxic racist imagery in art, regardless of the virtue or intention of the artist who created it. So he is, in a very strange way, eliding the difference between racist imagery and depictions of 
people who are racists. You know, he makes it sound as though the the image itself has some kind of fundamental, uh, as it were, persona that is harmful to others, no matter what any anyone says. I mean, Gustin in those images is showing the banal mundanity of white supremacy. Really, there's a comic. Um, humor and I guess people I get I get the difficulty in approaching the subject with the visual of cartoon and comic because it might be seen as making light of it but I think what he's trying to do is show the banalness the mundanity of believing this you know in believing in racism or propagating hate and showing sort of I don't know poking fun and yeah I just I remember that I think we should remember that, you know, in the midst of the Vietnam War and Black Power and Civil Rights Movement, Gustin's, Gustin was making work then, and it was criticised then, but so wondering whether it will be criticised or not criticised in 2024 is an interesting question. And um, what, what, uh, what are we hoping for in the next four years? I mean, I'm obviously hoping for progression, but I wonder whether it is something that we can truly hold that museums and that we as a sort of as art seeing people can hold ourselves to that it will be a better time to discuss this in 2024 i mean obviously i hope so but i wonder what is expected to change in those four years isn't it i mean one of the things i'm interested in is are the museums and we feel that you know from kaywin feldman's statement to for instance she she went on to the hyperallergic podcast and spoke at length about this issue and it seems that the national gallery is the most important museum in terms of the the decision making here yeah one of the things that that strikes me is to what extent are they preempting the response of their audience because I don't know how widely they have consulted their audiences about this. To take, for example, in the catalogue, there are two pieces written by African-American artists, Trenton Doyle Hancock and Glenn Ligon, which deal explicitly with the Klan imagery. And it seems to me that in, in doing that, the museums were very conscious that they wanted to get black voices involved in the planning of this exhibition and and the interpretation of this exhibition so perhaps you can answer this Andrea Mm. to what extent do you do you feel that this is a sort of patronizing attitude from the museums to their audiences and to their black audiences I think firstly it's important to remember that I believe that the Ku Klux Klan images make up maybe two rooms out of 12 and so I think a lot of people are looking at Gus and they'll read the headlines and they'll think this is a show of only these images when actually it spans, you know, his abstract works and many others in between. And so I'm worried that the discussion has gone so far that it's focusing only on these narratives and not on the entire picture. And whilst we're asking if the curators have done the work pertaining to that issue the curators have to do the work pertaining to all issues. Obviously, the, the racially sensitive ones will trump, but we need to in, ensure that curators are dealing with everything sensitively. Reading Glenn Ligon's catalogue text, it's very much in uh, in solidarity with uh, Guston's work. He says that they are, I think he used the word woke. Um, and so... Whilst I think that Glenn Ligon and the, the other artists that I've read in the open letter, their responses are important because it shows that it's not offensive to them, but we also need to make sure that we don't make it that their responses mean that it's okay. Uh, in the same way as me as a young black female writer and one of the only black voices to have written about the topic, because I think it's a terrible shame that the show isn't going to happen I think it's also important to note that just because I, as a black person, disagree with the cancellation, I can't speak for every black person living in America that or that would see the show. And whilst I believe really that the response might have incited protests, very much so, I also believe that encouraging controversial debate is important to the power of art. I don't think any one person can speak in terms of how it would be received, but I think it's dangerous to preempt a reaction without doing proper consultation. And the consultation was definitely there in the curation, but can anyone really preempt the response it would have had in the public? Not really. I think nothing has been um, preempted or being been able to be preempted this year in as a whole. So be curious as to see 
how museums could preempt a response from a large group of people in many different cities and uh, regions of the world. Barry, you, you, in, in, your, in the letter that you drafted that, that Andrea just referred to for the Brooklyn Rail and which was signed by the many artists, you, you reference Musa Mayer, who is, who is Guston's daughter and president of the Guston Foundation. And, and, and she addressed that, you know, that these are difficult images. They are not fixed. The imagery itself is difficult. And it's precisely that that, that Guston is aiming for, isn't it? These are not images that you can neatly encapsulate and sum up very easily, that, that they want to prompt you to think and to think about difficult stuff. Well, I think, first of all, he was not an artist who was there in his mature years to preach to anyone or tell anyone what, what to think. He was there in the first place to disturb himself. And if they disturb the rest of us, it's because he was dealing with things that he found very difficult to digest on his own terms. Uh, so naturally, it's not something that's that easy to kind of put a caption on that will tell any curious passerby, well, what should I think about this? How should I take that? You know, it's something much more full of ambivalence. Indeed. Um, you you organised the letter, and, and can you tell me something about that process? Because you drafted it, but did you get the contributions of artists to it? Well, I started to write the letter. I mean, let's say that it was my response when I read the New York Times article reporting on this uh, postponement was so uh, visceral and emotional, and I just had to, I kind of tried to tamp it down for a bit, but then after a day, I realized that there was nothing that I could do but at least write something that said what I thought about it. And I started to write it, and then I sent it around to a few friends. Um, but it was a very personal statement and a very angry one and a very emotional one. And uh, as I began to get some reactions to it, I realized that it was something that maybe I should rethink and that it could be something that wasn't just from me, but that would be something that many people could sign on to and support. But as I was circulating it, uh, one person wrote back and said essentially, well, uh, I basically agree with what you say, uh, but there are some problems with this letter. And uh, I think you can solve them by making these rewrites that I'm going to send to you. When I read the proposed edits, the letter, which came from the artist Adrian Piper, they were all completely brilliant and spot on and made the whole thing 100% clearer and stronger and better. Andrea, one of the commentaries about this subject has been that you've referred to it yourself, that you are one of the few commentators who has written a piece that, that is black that, that that very many of the commentators on this have been white voices often white male voices so one of the aspects that the director of the national gallery of art has said uh needed to change in the forthcoming show was that it, it should be done by non-white curators as well as white curators this exhibition this present exhibition was curated by four white curators do you think that the territory it has been overly occupied, if you like, by white voices? When you wrote about it, you agreed with many of the points that those voices were making in terms of the, the necessity for this show to go ahead. So, yes, um, I am one of the only, I think, well, or the only um, black voice to have come out, at least uh, publicly and in the written press, about the decision to cancel and also against the cancellation. Um, I've spoken to a lot of different artists who are black as well. And we before I wrote the article, um, I was musing on whether I should insert, insert myself into the debate. And then I thought it actually had a duty to do so because there was a call for another perspective because it was it became, um, you know, a cancellation by what by curators or by the um, by directors who are white about a show that was created by white people about a white artist that is doing um, appropriating black imagery that I want I don't agree that it's appropriation of black imagery but two I think it's important to note that all the curators of the show are Jewish 
Um, whether or not that means that they are white in the same sense as I think the consensus as to what we think of when we think of a white male curator, I think is important. Um, in general, the art world is occupied by white male voices, but I think it's important to understand the nuance of whiteness. And yes, there are very, there's the Caucasian and then there's also, um, you know, white passing, but people that have dealt with anti-Semitism or isolation or just otherness in a different way. And I think it's important to make sure that people are aware that the curators are white but they are all Jewish and as Gustin was and I think it's I know I just think it's an important nuance to address do I think that there should be a black curator I do do I think that the show was not contextualized without the curator I can't tell that because I haven't seen the show but I've read the catalogue and it does seem that the work has been done do I think it will benefit from a black curator yes but I still agree that the show would have addressed these issues well and is important in a time where we're, where we're calling for allyship. I also think there's an immense pressure by putting all of the curatorial decisions of um, of, of exhibitions to do with race on black curators only. And there's been discussions as to David Werner's um, black only black space. I should know that that's not obviously not the exact title, but a gallery that will have an all black staff with all black directorial team, and whether that's the answer. I'm not sure if that's the answer either, but I do think that if we're going to have shows that circulate around race, a diverse curatorial team is is obviously going to be a good thing. In short, the addition of a black curator would will be a great thing, but it will be an entirely different show. And I think what we've all realised is that yes, if it is if the show does happen in 2024. It will be a different show. It will have different curators. Obviously, it has to. It will definitely have to. It will have different loans. It will have a different um, checklist, and it will be completely different in terms of the time we're in. Because every, I think this year has proven to us that history is fast forwarding. Conversations are going faster, and so will racism be gone in twenty twenty four? No, but will we be more um, equipped to handle issues about race? I hope so, but I still don't believe that that should cause a what I think is a bit of a double censorship in approaching this show. And you mentioned something to do with um, it may be patronising black viewers. Um, I think it's not patronising to black viewers. I think it's patronising to viewers in general that they can't see a nuance in between painting a KKK image and understanding the difference between someone who paints it in a way that's poking fun and showing the ridiculousness and evil and making you force see it straight in front of you and forcing you into seeing it and just seeing it as racism. Uh, it's always kind of easy for people who are bosses to, uh, to require uh, something else from the people who work for them. But what about the people who are the bosses? Uh, why aren't we talking about why aren't there any black museum directors among these? Uh, instead of instead of uh, you know advocating that she'd like to hire a black uh, curator to to add on somehow to this show, just as Gustin looked at himself, maybe Kaywin Feldman and the other directors have to look at themselves and uh, not just at the the people who are below them. I think that's one of the things that I have found troubling about this is that the museums didn't feel equipped right now to address this issue, to say, OK, we've been planning a Guston show. It's taken five years, but the situation has changed. I think we all agree it is unequivocal <laughs> that the situation has changed. There is no, no one would dispute that. But... Isn't it a bit disturbing that the four museums didn't feel that they had the staff that could put together events programs, discussions, seminars, even change the interpretation in the museum within relatively short amount of time to reflect those changed circumstances? Doesn't it show a lack of confidence in the museum's own staff, their curatorial and educational staff, who are very brilliant and very connected to very diverse communities? Um, I I agree. I mean, I can only speak to the curators I know. And I I mean, Mark Godfrey, he created Soul of the Nation with Zoe Whitley. That was an incredible show. And I find it, I would be 
surprised if someone that can curate a show as nuanced and powerful as Soul of a Nation couldn't handle the work of Gustin, especially over five years. Also, the, the representation of black curators hasn't come up in the five years, only now that after the sort of the call for action for representation of black curators, are we now addressing the fact that there should have been a black curator in the show? If that's something that is a concern, it would have been a concern five years ago. There's only a few black curators in the UK. I mean, there's a, a, a very small pool um, of which I... I straddle between curator and writer, and so I've experienced and seen the um, the lack of representation in both fields. But that should have been something that should have been addressed five years ago. The conversation hasn't changed so much, other than now we're waking up to the fact that black curators should have visibility in the museum and obviously should be curating shows um, like this show. Uh, did they not realise that black curators need to curate uh, until now? I'm, I'm intrigued. The thing to add is that in a sense, it's it's a statement that proves itself because with their their announcement on the National Gallery website and then uh, the the interviews that Kaywin Feldman is given, uh, they've sort of shown themselves to be poor communicators uh, and to be kind of slippery in their statements. Even though the if you look at the catalog for the exhibition, the curators seem to be very thoughtful and very forthright and very serious about investigating all the issues that, that Gustin's work brings up. So there's, there's already a lot of material there for their, uh, their educational staffs to work with and, and so on. Andrea, you wrote a manifesto for how the art world should respond to Black Lives Matter. Could you not argue that what the museums were doing here was an attempt to do this? I think it definitely was an attempt and I understand the motivations towards it. I guess it, it's been a very emotional year for everybody and museums have also taken a lot of flack and have been forced to look inwards into the structures, into their programming, into their staff. Um, the intentions were good in that, I guess, they didn't want to may perhaps re- run the risk of causing any more pain with viewership. Where I think they've missed the mark is that they fast-forwarded us into an age of double censorship from the left as well as the right. Um, So by postponing the show, they postponed the conversations about the artwork, including those about whether white artists have the right to take racism as their subject. Luckily, because the postponement has caused a lot of debate, including this one, um, it means that we are addressing and confronting our ideas as to who has the right to discuss racial issues and issues that haven't affected them directly, Um, And I hope that those conversations continue. But in general, when I wrote my mission statement about how the art world can step up for Black Lives Matter, I think what I wanted was for museums to take risks and present material that encourages and moves forward to debate and society. And so even though on the surface, Gustin, as a white artist who's painting KKK images, may seem as something that should be talked and readdressed later. In fact, it's probably one of the more urgent questions and and artworks that we should be seeing today because it's pushing forward the debate and we shouldn't be afraid of questions, only not asking them. Because we are not getting the chance to interrogate this with Gustin's work in this exhibition, which, you know, it was going to be this groundbreaking large-scale retrospective that showed many aspects, including this, I fear that these questions and this debate won't be fully addressed in future exhibitions to come. And I really hope that this isn't a trend that continues. I can't speak for every black person and every black experience. I'm not a black American. And so I haven't, you know, been forced to experience the the threat of the Klan and Klan history as much as my American counterparts would have. But I do think in order to push forward the racial debate, we need to do some uncomfortable things. And art, I think, shouldn't be polite and it should um, force us to look inwards. And that's what Gustin does. Barry, I'm sure you agree with everything that uh, Andrea's just said. But I also wanted you to reflect on the effect of your of the letter that you that you drafted. And if we have this critical mass of artists who have said what they have said and demanded that the museums reinstate the show, 
these are powerful people in the art world. Do you, can you can you perceive that they've had any effect on the museums? Well, first of all, I think you have to reflect that big institutions and the people who work in them are concerned most of all with the safety of the institutions and of their positions within them. And that the kind of potential for controversy and for difficult conversations may appear to be threatening to to that security. And this is one of the big problems uh, that we have in in dealing uh, with, with, with museums and other similar institutions. Uh, I think the fact that with some of the most renowned artists in the world, artists who, who really, whose names are, uh, are a kind of byword for integrity and for devotion to, to the practice of art, uh, having signed onto this letter, the fact that the museum's won't directly respond to them is really uh, a terrible sign of how little the artist and therefore the art actually figures in their calculations about what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. That said, uh, I think that the letter may have had more effect than it seems in the uh, interview that uh, Kaywin Feldman gave to uh, Artnet. She kind of said, "Oh well, you know, we just took that day of 2024 kind of randomly out of a hat. It, do- it may it, maybe it doesn't really need to take so long. We're, we're we're working now on really figuring out what the what the actual schedule will be, and uh, I'm really hoping that it can be sooner than that. So, you know, I think that there'll be with some kind of face saving uh, rhetoric." I think there'll be some backpedaling, at least, on the idea that this is really going to be so uh, bad for for the museums to be to show art like this. I, I think they're going to step away a bit from from that idea. Um, just to add, in hearing about um, their hopes to put, uh, to fast forward the process and get the Guston show going again. I mean, I can only be thrilled because, I mean, the whole point of me writing the piece was because I love Guston and I want the work to be shown. Um, I hope that whatever um, contextualizations that they add and or sort of seek other perspectives that they seek positively impact the show and that it's not just a removal of the KKK images. Um, I just think that it's important to see them and that, the, the the reiteration of the Gosson show, the sooner it can be seen, the better. So if it's happening sooner than 2024, that can only be a good thing. And let's keep our fingers crossed. Well, Andrea and Barry, thank you both very much for talking about this enormously complex issue. <laughs> it is. Thank you. Thank you. You can read Andrea Emma Life's article on Guston at theguardian.com and the letter signed by the artists at brooklynrail.org. And do also listen to my interview for this podcast with Rob Storr, the author of a new book on Guston. You can find that conversation in the episode with Grayson Perry, which came out on the 18th of September. Louisa Buck interviews Maggie Hambling in a moment, but first, here are a few of the top stories on the art newspaper's website this week. The first details of the COVID-19 rescue grants to museums and art galleries in England were announced this week, as Gareth Harris writes. Arts Council England awarded £257 million in long-awaited grants to 1,385 museums, theatres and other cultural organisations across England as part of the UK government's £1.57 billion cultural recovery fund. Substantial grants included £534,000 to the Whitechapel Gallery, more than £650,000 to the Delaware Pavilion in Becks Hill, £220,000 to the Nottingham Contemporary Gallery and £789,000 to the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, which is yet to reopen. 
The artist Simone Lee will represent the United States at the Venice Biennale in 2022, making her the first black woman to secure this prestigious commission. Lee was selected by the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, and her presentation is organised by curators at the ICA Boston. You can read an interview with Simone Lee from last year at theartnewspaper.com. And finally, a seven-foot sculpture of Medusa that overturns the ancient Greek myth, depicting the Gorgon as an avenging victim of sexual assault holding the head of Perseus, was unveiled in New York on Tuesday, across the street from the Manhattan Supreme Court, where abusers such as Harvey Weinstein have stood trial. The statue by the Argentine-Italian artist Luciano Garbatti was originally created in 2008 and gained widespread attention on social media in the wake of the Me Too movement. You can read all these stories and much more at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS, which you can get from the App Store. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This October, Christie's London and Christie's Paris join forces to present 20th Century London to Paris, a new sale series celebrating the best in Impressionist, modern, post-war and contemporary art and design. Experience Christie's new hybrid style live stream auctions and explore masterpieces by modern icons including Francis Bacon, Peter Doig, David Hockney, Pierre Soulage, Zawu Ki, Pablo Picasso and more. Christie's will offer Marina Abramovich's The Life, the first mixed reality artwork and the only work of its kind to be presented at auction. Christie's auctioneers will be taking bids in consecutive sessions on the 22nd of October, kick-starting with Paris Avant-Garde, followed by the post-war and contemporary art evening sale in London and Thinking Italian Art and Design. The series concludes with day sales in both cities on the 23rd of October. Two great cities, six unmissable auctions. Discover the season's top works and more information on christies.com. Welcome back. Before we hear from Maggie Hambling, don't forget to catch up with the art newspaper's other podcast, A Brush With, featuring in-depth artist interviews. Do subscribe to hear new episodes in the coming weeks. You can do that at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon or wherever you're listening now. Now, the artist Maggie Hambling has an exhibition at the Marlborough Gallery in London, coinciding with her 75th birthday. She'll also soon unveil a public sculpture commemorating Mary Wollstonecraft in East London and is the subject of a forthcoming BBC film. The art newspaper's contemporary art correspondent Louisa Buck went to Marlborough to meet her. So Maggie, we have several roomfuls of amazing works covering a multitude of different subjects, but I want to home in first of all on one of the first ones you see when you walk in, which is called Caged, and it's a great big black backgrounded cage full of birds trying to burst out now that was made before lockdown but how was your lockdown was it was that a premonition of how things were going to be or did you find lockdown actually rather a relief because a lot of these works were made during lockdown as well well it's interesting you said birds louisa because at the beginning of that painting there were three birds Uh, trying to get out of that cage and then I distilled it and distilled it until it's actually one bird trying to get out of the cage and and it didn't occur to me until uh, someone said to me it's very strange that last year you painted that painting and now we're all in our cages so of course when you know it was painted a year before but uh, my dear friend George Melly I uh, always said artists seem to know things before they happen and uh, foretell the future. You know, not that I know any lottery numbers or anything useful, but <laughs> that cage painting certainly happened before the current situation of all our conditions of being caged. Yeah. And how was it for you being caged? Well, of course, uh, as my habit is to get up very early in the morning, five or six, and go straight into the studio. I'm very lucky in that I just carried on doing what I do every day anyway. What I began to miss, of course, was um, hugging close friends. You know, I'm quite a physical person, and that was the the head of it. Um, And the self-portrait angry in the big gallery one downstairs, that was the first painting I did once lockdown happened, because... Anger was my first response. I I was supposed to be showing something in New York, uh, all these plans, things that everybody has, you know, suddenly were in the soup. I mean, gone, disappeared. I mean, nothing that you thought was going to happen 
was clearly going to happen. And so my first reaction was of, of fury. And there are some quite doer works. I mean, Bad Day is almost completely abstract, lumpen of grey with, with a cigarette stuck into it. And then quite a lot of the self-portraits that you've done seem during lockdown, during 2020, this year, seem to be very turbulent in their paint. I mean, the earlier self-portraits from the year before, the paint seems almost to vanish. There's big white spaces in that I don't associate you with at all. But then come lockdown, the paint seems to come flooding back again. Well, sometimes it's thick and sometimes it's thin. I mean, my whole uh, feeling about oil paint is that it's live, sexy stuff, and I'm still discovering things that it can do. You see, the subject in my case. I mean, life dictates what I paint. And so the subject is uh, like my lover, and I'm making love with this sexy stuff. It's a very intimate, intimate thing. And as I say, I don't think the paintings could have been done in any other medium. And I've tried uh, to... The corneal thing of less is more in many of those self, new self-portraits. Do you know that to try to be eloquent with far less paint than than often before, but then occasionally a painting like the uh, hot afternoon Brompton Cemetery, that sex and death painting, are... Uh, They're almost like a tangle of skulls there, yeah. Well, skulls and other things going mm, on. Yeah. But that suddenly demanded a lot of paint, you know? And that I remember do, doing a talk somewhere and somebody asked me about the texture in my paintings and I got really angry. I said, what do you mean texture? Texture belongs to silk or, or velvet or, or whatever it is, or fur, a texture. I mean, they're layers of failure. I mean, some paintings happen very, very quickly when the muse is with me. And other paintings can go on for months or even years. But I think the essential thing is to, however long a painting is taken to do, to bring it into that one moment of the painting. I mean, I don't like paintings that look as though they should be winning the Duke of Edinburgh Award for diligence. You know, they've got to, be, you know, if they can have any life to them, they all have to come together into one moment, regardless of how long they've taken to make. You've also been lately de-skilling yourself a bit. You've, I've seen the, in the BBC programme, which I've had a sneaky preview of, which is coming out later on this month, which is very appropriately called Making Love with the Paint. Um, so you've got this sense of, of, of this, 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 you know, your love affair with the paint is, is very much evident throughout that. But every morning you make a drawing and you've been making it in your left hand. Why is that? Well, after all these years, and I, I you know, I've... Uh, Art began for me when I was 14, and uh, as you probably know, I'm about to be 75. Don't look it. Congratulations. (laughs) That's the right comment, Louisa. (laughs) Um, You know, after all these years, the right hand is so full of tricks. And so this working, as I have for a couple of years now, every morning with ink in a sketchbook, the first thing I do is renew the sense of touch. Uh, the, The left hand can produce unexpected things. Uh, which is which is good because I mean everything. The word experiment is is highly overused, but for me everything, whether it's a drawing on a piece of paper the size of a postcard or whether it's a seven by nine foot canvas, I mean every single thing has to be an experiment. Otherwise, you know things led to habit and mannerism and and, and all the rest of it. All my work is about feeling and each subject demands its own set of marks, if you like. Because you've said the work's in charge of me, I'm not in charge of it. What what do you mean by that? Because it's you making the work, there you are with your brush in your hand or your left hand, right hand with your drawing. What do you mean by this? Do do you go into a kind of trancey state when you're painting? What is that? Well, there's early morning drawings which are uh, very important to me. Uh, Quite often I do them with my eyes shut. And as I say, it's sort of like a pianist doing the scales, renewing the sense of touch every morning. And uh, I do believe the thing, that the subject must be in charge of the artist, not the other way round. And a subject chooses you. That was said to me by my first art teacher at school. 
the subject chooses the artist, not the artist choosing the subject. And so the subject is in charge. And you know, I spend my <laughs> my daily life in the studio. I live in a state of almost permanent doubt, you know, doubt. No, not to overdo it and play violins, but I, you know, I have doubt the whole time. And then on the uh, the marvellous moment of the arrival of the muse, I do believe in all that. And when I've sufficiently emptied myself for the subject to come through me into the piece of work, and then the piece of work paints itself, and those are the great moments. But, I mean, I can... I could have gone through pure hell before that happening. There are a lot of self-portraits in this show. Is that a form of self-scrutiny for you? Is it because you're the nearest model to hand? How does that play out? Yeah, you know, I mean, life really does dictate what I make. I mean, for instance, the painting Gulf Women Prepare for War, which is in the New Hall Art Collection in Cambridge. I mean, the shock in the 80s of this photograph in the paper, it was a black and white photograph, of these women in, to me at that time, seemingly biblical dress, practicing using rocket launchers in the middle of the desert. You know, it was such a, such a shocking visual thing that I had to respond and make a piece of work about it. And then, as you know, if somebody dies, somebody I love very much, I would go on painting them for a year or two after they've died. Uh, so, so when if somebody ever says, "Well, what will you be painting? Will you be painting animals or something in six months?" I say, I say, I don't know. It's not really up to me. It's whatever gets me by the short and curlies, uh, and forces me to do something about it in my work. And I think a piece of work can only move someone else in as much as the artist has been moved by the subject. There is a room full of extraordinary paintings of animals, but animals in an abject state, a rhinoceros without its horn, elephants without their tusks, a terrifying dancing bear. I mean, where did these animals come from? I haven't seen you paint animals in such quantity before since you painted bulls all those years ago. You went on safari, didn't you, some time ago? Is that what triggered it? Well, it may have triggered it. It may have triggered it. I mean, I was, I think now that the beginning of my sculpture, Scallop on Suffolk Beach... On, on Albra Beach in Suffolk, I mean, probably began when at the age of seven I was on Albra Beach watching the fireworks for the coronation. You know, this is explosions in the sky and in the sea and uh, all around and you know, fantastically exciting. And so that, that you know, scallop probably began then, but you can only see these things much afterwards. But these animals seem to be triggered by a situation. There's the polar bear, there's that tragic, thick black painting with a, the animal shape in the centre called The Last Animal. There's a, a painting called The Last Baboon. The animals that you paint have been mutilated, have been killed by poachers. I mean, this is a, these are elegiac, poignant, you know, savage, tragic paintings. Well, they'd actually follow on from my last show of uh, The Ice Caps Melting. I mean, the way that we are completely fucking up the world uh, is something that I am appalled by. And so these animals follow naturally on. And indeed, it was a long while ago, 12 or 15 years ago, that I went on safari, much against my will, and then found that I loved it very much. And each morning early in the Jeep had my sketchbook and through the animals and then again in the evening. And then why they suddenly last year decided to be painted, I really don't know. The last baboon was the first of them and then the, it moved on through the um, elephant without its tusk and the rhinoceros. And, but this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. You know, just as we're fucking up Antarctica. We're, we're, you know, I'm sort of pleased in a way that I will never have grandchildren and their grandchildren. What will there be left for those children to see? And the, the, that, that smaller painting, The Last Animal, is, uh, it, it, you know, it could be a dog, it could be a donkey, it could be many kinds, doesn't matter. I mean, that, that painting, The Last Animal, is when everything has gone. We've fucked up the entire world and all its animals and probably its people. And you're bringing back quite a few people in the show. I mean, I'm thinking of the paintings, particularly of Arthur Lett Haynes, who was an important figure in your life, hadn't appeared for a while, and back he comes. Tell a little about who he was and what he meant to and why he's come back. 
Well, L- Arthur Lett Haynes, yes, um, the artist uh, who lived with uh, the artist Cedric Morris. They together ran the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing. It's where Freud started to paint, I mean, many years before me. The artist's house was on the edge of Hadley in Suffolk, where I grew up, and I took my first two oil paintings under my arm to show Cedric, because my parents needed some sort of encouragement. And Lett became my mentor, and he's the person who said the most important thing that anyone's ever said to me, which is that you must make... At the age of 15, it was such a privilege to be told you must make your work your best friend. In other words, you can go to it whatever you're feeling. You know, you're tired, you're sad, you're happy, you're randy. Whatever you're feeling, go to your work and have a conversation with it. And that's how I've led my life. And this other sort of thing, which may sound odd, but which is true, is that in the studio, when I'm trying to make something, that's what is, to me, real life. And whatever happens outside the studio could be more of a charade, you know? Then, Lett's face seems to be part of coming out of the paint in a room that is really quite an extraordinary room, all devoted to the laugh, to laughing heads. But these are, this is not merry jolly laughter to my mind, this is laughter on the edge of hysteria. These are faces on the edge of disintegration, skull-like, these great big gaping mouths. Where did these laughs come from, Maggie? Well, in the 90s, you may remember, I was trying to paint the laugh, the sound of the laugh in the 90s, when everything was doom and gloom and Mrs Thatcher. There are people who don't laugh. I personally try not to spend too much time with them. But, I mean, the most disastrous things you could think of, pretty damn quickly, somebody has made a joke of it, and I don't don't know how else one goes on living without laughing. I mean, as Oscar Wilde said... You know, if you if you think life is a comedy, but if you feel life is a tragedy, and that couldn't be truer. And so the laughing is very very important to me. And at that and the challenge, you know, the, the the challenge of painting the animals was not to be sentimental, which I don't think I have been, thank goodness. But the challenge of painting the laugh is obviously the moment the mouth is open. You know, can could be a scream, could be a a roar, a yell, or something. And obviously, laughing and crying are so close together. They're almost. I mean, it's like life and death. They they are so very close. And I'm I'm still hope out of these more figurative paintings than the '90s paintings. I still I was trying to paint the sound of laughter coming out of those, out of the mouths of those heads. Uh, Still, you say more figurative than the abstract paint of the nineties. You're right. Yes, that they were just conjuring up a laugh and gesture and colour. But nonetheless, a lot of these works in this show push towards the edge of abstra- abstraction. Some of the self-portraits. Yes, I can make you out just. But if there's a title and I can see it's you and it coalesces, but it then evaporates again. I mean, it seems that with a lot of the works, the more recent works, you are patrolling these edges of pushing paint to its paintliness, as it were, push, pushing it to the edges of, of figuration. I know you hate the word abstract and abstraction, but nonetheless, you are always walking that knife edge, it seems. Yeah, but I think the minute you pick up a brush or a knife or your hand or whatever you happen to put the paint on, the canvas with you, you know, you you. Ha- if you're not walking that tightrope, if you're not on the edge of something, the thing is not going to have any life to it. And and as I get older, I have taken on board that less is more. And as I'm trying, as I always have been trying to get to the essence of the subject, but it's it is happening in a more in a lot of these paintings in a more economic way. And you recently accepted a commission to do another public sculpture. You've mentioned the scallop shell in Albury. You've also made the memorial to Oscar Wilde. And now you're doing Mary Wollstonecroft, the great advocate for equality of the sexes. I mean, the vindication of the rights of women, the first great book about the equality of, of, between men and women, um, a great philosopher, mother of Mary Shelley. How did this come about? And, and what are you going to be, how are you going to be portraying her? We'll have to wait, I think, until, uh, I believe, something like the 10th of November. Give us a clue. To see what I've cut. No, absolutely, uh, until the 10th of November, 
It has to be um, unspoken of. So what were you thinking about when you were making the work? What, me- <laughs> what medium What medium is it? Is? I was in the usual doubt and hell all the time, <laughs> all the time, all the time. I mean, I think one or two people were asked to do it and they chose me and you'll have to wait and see, Is it Louisa. bronze? Maybe. Mm. And there she is in Newington Green. Or will be, yes. Will be. Um, so, but public sculpture, I mean, sculpture is a whole other strain of what you do and your paintings and sculpture often do seem to overlap yeah. you make coloured sculpture you paint the sculptures they have that very gestural kind of animated quality to them do you see them as very distinct processes do you go into sort of sculpture no, no, mode when you're I making mean, them I've been, have been asked you know, do I prefer painting or sculpture which is a rather silly question not by you uh, but other people have said to me well, I mean the fact is it's whatever I'm doing at the time you know and I mean, sculpture really came back into my work in the in the nineties during making those laugh paintings, um, when I realised I was more and more painting an object uh, in space, an object floating around in some kind of space of whatever colour. And I, you know, being a bit slow coming from Suffolk, it took me a while to realise I probably should be making objects, you know, which is something I hadn't done since Ipswich Art School in the in the sixties. And so sometimes sculpture has led to a painting or a painting has led to a sculpture, but it's in fact whatever whatever is in my hands at the time. So we're not going to see a Mary Wollstonecroft series of paintings, or maybe we are. I'm not a fortune teller, Louisa. However, you have become a sort of adjunct to a fashion designer. You've got a whole, <laughs> you've got a whole range of, of, of amazing clothes brought out by art school designers of using your brush strokes on jackets using artist smock inspired not that i've ever seen you in an artist smock i hasten to add artist smock inspired dresses but how does that feel i mean to have your have your it great feels, gestural brush strokes on 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 fabric it really feels on quite extraordinary this this young fashion house called art school approached me and said they would like to make these some um, clothes uh <laughs> with somehow my paintings on them and the walls of water paintings the, they are amazing they are the most beautiful silk and incredibly beautifully made and and so i thought that that's very exciting and then and then it, i didn't quite realize at the time that i was going to have to put these garments on and kind of <laughs> Well, and, and be photographed in them, admittedly by Jürgen Teller. I wasn't going up and down a catwalk, but that part of it was all quite funny. When you look at my stature, small and squat, I'm the opposite of any kind of fashion model we're used to thinking of, you know. But it's all been quite fun, and the, and the, the, the jackets and the coats, I think, and all sorts of things, um, they're quite amazing because they're very beautifully made. Will you be doing any more, do you think? I don't know. I'm, I'm waiting for Chanel and a few people to sort of approach me. So next week, you miraculously turn 75. I, quite unlikely. I can't believe you're, you've reached that advanced age. Um, what advice would you give to young Maggie setting out now with the benefit of a few decades okay, okay. of art making? Okay. My first show in London... 1973 at Morley Gallery, part of Morley College. Someone called Geoffrey Solomons, who was director of Fisher Fine Art, a very big grand gallery at the time, came early to the private view and stood with me in front of a, a large painting of Lett, actually, of Lett Haynes, sitting in a chair. And there was me, a baby artist, my first show. And he said, if you do me 20 of these, we'll give you a show. Well, now... A lot of baby artists would have trotted out 20 of those and had a show. I said, why would I want to trot out 20 of these? No. I mean, Lett and Cedric, who hated all art dealers, thought they were all crooks and shits. But that thing of being independent, to have one's own spirit and uh, listen to the inner voice rather than ever being told what to do, it's not something I'm very good at. Is incredibly important, and so you see, I, th- I can see how a young a young artist can have a huge success, perhaps with a degree show, or if we're ever allowed to have anything like this again, you know, and the the huge success with a degree show be snapped up by a gallery, and then just forced, you know, if the painting happens to be a milk bottles, to carry on painting milk bottles for the rest of their lives because they sell. Well, I'm afraid I'm the opposite of that. 
Now, I have to, as I say, life dictates what I make in my work, and I can't tell what will happen next. Sounded like you didn't actually need to be given any advice as a young Maggie or indeed as a more mature Maggie. Thank you very much, Maggie Hamling. Thank you, Louisa. Maggie Hambling 2020 is at Marlborough in London until the 21st of November. The film Making Love with the Paint is on BBC Two on 24th of October at 9pm and on BBC iPlayer. Now for this episode's work of the week. The artist Martha Tuttle currently has an exhibition at the Storm King Art Centre in New Windsor, New York and she's chosen to talk about a medieval sculpture of the Visitation in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. She spoke to our senior editor in New York, Margaret Carrigan, about the work. You can see an image of the sculpture at theartnewspaper.com, go to the podcast tab and look for this episode. Martha, you've chosen a early 14th century sculpture called The Visitation by Master Heinrich of Constance. Um, It's a really beautiful little piece, two women standing representing um, the Virgin Mary and her cousin Elizabeth. They're both pregnant and they're, you know shooting the shit about what it means to be pregnant, I assume. Um, and, you know, Mary's got the news that she, you know, hers is divine. So um, I, I wondered when you first saw this, this work and what struck you about it then? And in general, do you find yourself attracted to medi- medieval works or is this one particularly interesting for you? I mean, I love medieval works um, because of their use of materiality and because materials hold so much symbolic resonance, I think, in medieval works. But this work, I think, especially strikes me because of its um, relationship to the feminine and a kind of uh, female tenderness. I don't remember ever not knowing about it, which I think with works that mean the most, it's either way. Either there's like one moment that you were like, oh, that came into my life and it was so significant, or it just feels like it was always there, or like maybe you knew it in many lifetimes. And I think this one is the latter. So I probably saw it when I was a child, and then it's just become a kind of constant presence uh, in artworks that mean the most to me. There is a sense of intimacy in the way that the two figures are together. And there's also this kind of, I don't know, like maybe I'm reading too much into it, but there's also this kind of yonic womb power in the little crystal cove that they're both holding onto that kind of represents their, you know, their wombs and where they would be holding their child. And maybe that's too woo-woo for 14th century Europe, but like, honestly, I kind of doubt it. There was a lot of woo-woo going on then. Um, So I wonder if there's a kind of feminist reading that you've brought to the work as you've grown older and have that more critical eye on art. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Not being a medievalist scholar, I I'm I'm sure this is not the right way to read this piece. Um, But I often hear the Christ story, and I think even though um, Mary is uh, spoken about often, it's the men in that story, specifically Christ, specifically God, um, that are really centered. And I think that in this piece, the women, um, both Mary and Catherine, are the ones who are centered. And um, I think that as much as this might be a pregnancy scene. I think it's also a scene um, about uh, inner life and these two women experiencing uh, inner life with one another. Um, And I think that centers them far more than the future of the life of Christ. Um, So that's my personal reading, and I would say that it is a feminist one. I also love the idea that even though this is a sculpture made by a man, it was taken care of um, and imbued with the energy of the women who both cared for it, uh, learned from it, and maybe had conversations around it. And so I like thinking that although there is one artist who makes a work, that the people for centuries who look at it um, are also absorbed. And so whatever creative force that that 
material object might have today uh, is kind of an amalgamation of everyone who was engaged with it. And I think, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the woo-woo thing. I think this is also, to be honest, one of the reasons why I love medieval art so much is that material both represented qualities, but I think they were also trying to like work out ways that the material itself could be those qualities. And um, one of the, the things that people had to grapple with, I imagine, was like, how do you use... Um, a material on earth so it is by nature decaying to represent something that is supposed to be infinite which is God or or holiness and I think one of the answers was using crystals and using gems um, both because they represented wealth but also because they didn't decay visibly and I think the the hope of translation was at least in my mind a little bit that they they are um, a kind of vitality, a kind of magic vibrance in and of themselves when when utilized in a particular sculptural context. I'm really, really happy that you brought this up because I want to give listeners a sense of what kind of materials are used in this work. Um, it's carved in walnut, you know, they both have their little crystal covered cavities and it's still like, you know, it's got a little bit of gilding on it that's in really, you know, been really well preserved. And I obviously the crystals have, like you said, a a certain amount of divine significance within this kind of work. But you also use a lot of crystals and rocks in your latest works. And so I kind of wanted to know what significance they hold for you. Just as a side note, one of the things that I just wanted to point about about this sculpture um, is that the the crystals are before gem cutting. was developed, which was developed around the 15th century. And I've been getting really, really into the visuals of this, um, these kind of rounded gemstones. And they don't shine in the same way that we associate uh, gems to shine today, but they hold a particular kind of milky, um, almost, I would say, spiritual light. Uh, So I just wanted to add that in real quick. Thank you for doing so, because I had no idea that gem cutting wasn't a thing until the 15th century. That's a really important historical data point. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I just I, I read about that recently, and I was pretty fascinated by it, um, just because the visuals are, are so different. And, and yeah, the way that we, we see gems today and associate them with a kind of luxury uh, is a particularly defined aesthetics with its own history um, that, that may have nothing or a lot to do with the qualities of gems themselves. So I've been thinking about that a lot. You know, I think that the most important thing and question in my work is how one has intimacy with the world around them. Um, And especially in a world that exists outside of a human time frame. Um, And ultimately that is an ecological question for me as I think that while legislative um, and scientific and political ecologies are crucial and uh, towards figuring out a symbiosis with their world, I think that a, a felt and a emotional connection also needs to be built up in order for people to kind of have a felt symbiosis as well as an intellectual one. Um, and so stones for me become a really, really important um, subject matter because I'm interested in developing like a kind of intimacy with them or an empathy with the stone. Um, And I think even though, uh, not to speak for all people, but even though so many of us might not grant stones the same kind of animacies that we might grant a tree, I think a lot of us even subconsciously have a relationship to picking up stones on the beach or stacking them in our houses. And and I, I believe that that is indicative of a kind of relationship with the mineral bodies. Um, and maybe even, and sorry if this is too woo-woo, but drawing a correlation between our own mineral bodies and the mineral bodies um, of a different scale and of a different material formation. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in that in my work in general. And then I think going back to the piece, because this work both um, kind of centers the 
crystals in in the women's uh, interiors and tenderness to me personally it correlates the two things together which i find really beautiful i think that this work is so beautiful and thank you so much for sharing it with us thank you so much maggie this conversation has been wonderful Outlook's Martha Tuttle is at the Storm King Art Centre in New Windsor until the 9th of November, and you can read more about the visitation at metmuseum.org. And that's it for this week. Do subscribe to the art newspaper at theartnewspaper.com, click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page and you'll find a range of subscriptions. Also, at the top right of the page you can find a link to subscribe to our various newsletters. And please subscribe to this podcast and a brush with if you haven't already. Do give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. You can also find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Producers of The Week in Art are Julia Mahalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks to Andrea and Barry, to Louisa and Maggie, to Margaret and Martha. And thank you for listening. See you next week. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.